uh, letting me talk here. Um, uh, I will talk about this non-commutative geometry, but uh, since you know there there's a lot of uh, uh, song and dance mathematically, there's I I will probably not go deep into the details. So what I'm gonna do is that I try uh, I will try to show you um, the intuition, the physics out of this non-commutative geometry. Okay. So this is the very short uh, review of the gauge theory. So when we say, uh, in general, uh, when we say uh, an operator transforms covariantly, what do we mean? We mean that we have a state, right? And this state transforms like this. And there is an operator acting on this state. And this operator, if, if it transforms this way, together they transform like this, okay? And when we write them, um, we, when we use them to write the Lagrangian, we have an invariant theory. So when we um, localize that transformation, um, this transformation U here, if we make, make it um, coordinate dependent, then we will, uh, this operator will transform with a local term. Okay. So what do we do? If we simply write this um, again in this sandwich term, we will get a, an extra term, which means it's not covariant. So we need to come up with another field. Right. So it transforms similarly, but with a different sign here. When we combine them two, we have, again, a covariant operator. So take U1 gauge theory for, for an example. If we write down the uh, Dirac uh, Lagrangian, then we can uh, see just uh, uh, there is a U1 symmetry here, and Lagrangian is invariant. When we localize this transformation, we have a local term. So what we do is that we come up with a gauge field which transforms with this extra local term but a different sign. So when we combine them two, we have an invariant theory again. And then we say we have this local symmetry. So let's think about this in the language of non-commutative geometry. So in non-commutative geometry, we have three uh, central elements. First one, we have a C-star algebra. Okay, so this algebra here, in this case, is the smooth function. And uh, since this is the spinner bundle, we use all the spinners as the representation space. So first of all, yeah. I'm ignorant of, ex of exactly what, what's a C-star algebra? Uh, C star, sorry. Uh, C star algebra uh, is something, uh, the algebra equipped with this star, the involution. So uh, an example is that uh, um, we have, for example, we have um, A, B, and we have a star. And then this is equal to B star, A star. This operation can be, for example, in matrix, it can be transposed, or it could be Hermitian. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, complex conjugate. So, uh, in general, uh, a st uh, uh, an, an algebra equipped with this property is a star algebra. C star algebra is like a, uh, a variety of algebra with this property. So, one example is that this um, uh, smooth function, so this star would become the complex conjugate. And we have A, the algebra, we have the representation, and we have this Dirac operator. So what do we do? We look at the unitary transformation. By unitary transformation, I mean we choose all the elements in A such that these elements are unitary. We apply that on the representation, and uh, A, uh, so what is A? Is the smooth functions on, yeah, smooth functions. on M? Yes, because that forms an algebra, right, point-wise. Okay, sure. And uh, uh, 
if we so, look so what, yes. when, when you're saying you dagger you uh -huh. that is a that's really just from the point if, if I'm thinking of you as, as smooth function this uh -huh. is just it's a pure case this is just just a pure case u complex conjugate times yes. u point loss okay. yes right um, you all see that more general case and then sure. this one is a certain example so this is actually just the complex conjugate so when we look at the D applying on psi, we see it transforms like this. And we can write it as UD plus D mu commutator. And uh, if we look at this, so this D mu <coughs> commutator term is nothing but the, the local twist, the local term, the der derivative term. And if we write the sandwich term, we see there's an extra term. Whenever this term vanishes, we have a symmetry, and it's the global symmetry, the original global symmetry. This corresponds to d theta equals zero. So the question is, what if this commutator is not equal to zero? So we use the old trick. We come so up with, yes, question? Uh, I'm, I'm just a Sorry, these are uh, very yeah, basic yeah, yeah, questions. But, um, so, uh, I'm sorry, D before was the Dirac operator, uh -huh. but now you have it as an operator acting on, instead, this smooth, smooth functions, functions, not yes. on the sections of the... Um, you see, no, they, they are, they are. They are. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to apply everything on the section, on the spinner, right? But here, you can, oh, just here. You can play the trick like we, apply D on this section, and the section transforms like U times the uh, spinner, and uh, of course we can flip them, but with the price of adding a commutation term. Right. And this derivative, in this specific case, the Dirac operator commutating with smooth function is the derivative term. Right. So, so basically the spinners are representations of the algebra so the algebra element acting on the spinner makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Okay. Yes. Uh, sh so the question is, the question is, what should the gauge look like? Okay. So if we look at the transformation, we will see that uh, it transforms roughly with this extra term. So we want to absorb this extra term in some kind of uh, object. Okay. So we come up with that kind of object, an operator, formed this way. So A, B are both from the algebra, and D is the Dirac operator. You can tell that um, you can tell that this actually is a specific type of this, because the U here is the unitary element. Okay. And the idea is that when we do the transformation, for example, when we do the uh, uh, transformation, this D goes to D plus this term. And this term looks like a specific part, like a, 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 a zero of this operator we just built. Well, okay. And so if we want, if we could let the operator transform accordingly, then we will have, um, we could have a covariant operator. So when we combine them two, we have a covariant operator. So in this sense, this differential one form is kind of replaced with this object. Okay. And uh, we can see that in this case, this D, the Dirac operator, works as the, one, the basis of one form. Okay. So when we combine them two, we have Sorry, this, this is a typo. It should be like a, a, a covariant derivative, so the generalization of the covariant derivative. So the question is, what for? Why do we rewrite everything we already know? So your AI and BI were completely arbitrary. Any choice of AI and BI will do the <coughs> job for you? Um, yeah, um, it has certain uh, conditions. I didn't, I just skipped that for uh, simplicity. So uh, you need like to make the gauge field self-adjoint, uh, I mean, formation. 
right? And uh, you also have some other conditions you need to make that, uh, like fulfill the order one condition, for example. I will talk about that later. There are certain specific conditions. But you will choose the AI and BI ones, and that will work for all the views. Mm, the idea is that you need to sum up the A, D, B commutator with all the A, I, B, oh, I. you're summing over all the A. Right, you sum up over, sum them up. Okay. okay. But so that's a very bad sum, right? Because A, I, and B, I are in a huge space of all functions. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's not so clear what, what that you can really make such a sum. It's like uh, formally you have um, something that you can absorb the extra term, and that's the idea. And so roughly AI goes over a complete basis of functions and BI also goes over uh -huh. a complete basis of functions? Um, roughly like that. Okay. So the idea is that with a few modifications, we can generalize the gauge theory very easily. And that's why we choose to write this in a commutator uh, form. So let's look at this example. If we choose A equal to complex number plus another complex number. So earlier, we have the smooth function. So the function, uh, the algebra, which is the smooth function, is nothing but the map from the base manifold to the complex number. So once we change the algebra, I mean, according to uh, Guy van Neymark, there, if ever, uh, any uh, C star algebra, we can find a geometry corresponding to the algebra. So what would the geometry look like? So when we change this C infinity m to C plus C, roughly we change the base manifold to a very simple object. It's two point, right? You have um, a complex value at one point and another complex value at the other point. Similarly, um, so uh, when we change this uh, algebra, we change the, the geometry. But the question is, even we do this analog, um, we haven't defined the relation between the two points. <coughs> right, so how should we define the relation between the two points? So in this uh, ordinary case, the distance formula we write is the infimum of the uh, line segment along some curve, the integration of along some curve, okay? And this formula actually can be changed to this one. So the supremum of the difference between the algebra value with the condition that the derivative is less than or equal to one. So how do we understand this? Let me show you some pictures. So in this simplest example, if we want to describe the distance between these two points, what do we do? We choose a smooth function, which has a derivative less than or equal to one. We take the difference of the, uh, out, uh, the function's value, and we see this is less than the distance. So we might choose another another function with slightly uh, larger derivative than this one, th the difference is a bit closer to the distance here. So maybe another one. And then we see in this case, the supremum would be the one with a constant uh, derivative equal to one. And then the difference here is equal to the difference here. This is just for a one dimensional example. Yeah. But uh, that's the idea of that formula. Mm -hmm. You can generalize that. Uh, so what, what generalizes the absolute value of the derivative of f when there is? Oh, uh, is the, like the gradient is less than or equal to one. And that then no, you no, take the gradient this. gradient is, is a vector. Uh-huh. So you take the norm. You take the norm, yes. With a, is there a metric then? Uh, <laughs> In other words, I'm, I'm wondering whether the uh, say, the um, has, uh, it's the, I think um, it should be uh, the P2 norm, but uh, I, I can't tell the details at this moment. Um, what is the P2 norm? You have a matrix and then you have the, right, the, uh, 
square of that, so that you have uh, right. Uh, let's skip that for <laughs> for this <laughs> moment. <laughs> Right. Um, the metric is induced, I think. The other algebra isn't that the that's what I'm that's what I'm trying isn't to that get the at, so that's why I am that's why I'm a little confused. <laughs> I, 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 I thought that this was like the way to like reconstruct the metric on the non commutative space time. Yeah, I think this is how we construct that. Yes, right, that's so right. You, you can't but uh, uh, this is when, when you talk about this norm, I think it, it should be uh, like uh, be careful because it it deals with all these matrices and the, the representations. Right. So there um you, you need to define the norm um, carefully, but uh, this is really how we define the metric actu actually in non commutative geometry. You have the geometry, you, you have the algebra first, and you're trying to reconstruct the geometry from the algebra. Yes. So the idea is that the geometry appears um, induced by this, or by this algebra. And you can define the norm and things like that just within the algebra. You saying if I just know the algebra of smooth functions on the manifold, that specifies for me what the manifold is. What what the metric structure of that manifold is, not just a smooth structure. Yeah, actually, the, the idea. I think the idea is that you can you do not lose any information if you study all the continuous function, uh, all the smooth function. Um, I mean, you switch from the geometry to all the smooth function, and you do not lose any information. You can study that. I have two smooth manifolds, which are topologically equivalent, but one has a, a they're metrically different. Uh -huh. You're saying, I would have thought they had exactly the same algebra of smooth function. So I'm just a little, maybe, maybe I'm yeah. Doesn't share a condition on the derivative of that? Oh, I, I, simplified, in it? I simplified I here. Uh, I simplify this one here because this is just one dimensional case. But in actually, you have know, G mu nu, G mu f, G mu f. Uh, actually, you don't have G mu nu at this moment. Yeah. Because the whole question, the whole question is to that they can reduce the method. Well, to, to generalize the norm. How do you define the norm on dx? Yeah. Uh, That's a vector field on the because manifold. How do you map that to? The translator, you will <laughs> see that this differential operator will be generalized to a matrix. And this matrix, applying all, all these kind of uh, representations, they could be. What's the absolute value of that matrix? Uh, you can have the uh, norm of the matrix, right? Of course you can do that. And its components are derivatives of that. No, the derivative is, you know, is defined in a particular way which doesn't make any reference to the variable. Right, right. So far we but you have indices. How do you contract the indices? That's the point. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Chief. Like <coughs> you they are vectors, how do you that's the, that's the question. You're gonna show uh, us later anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Actually, let's go on. I think the question was that if you have a if you change the quarter from X to X prime, uh -huh. it would seem that the derivative would change. Yeah, but the, the, the point is that later you will lose the point description of the geometry. You don't, uh, for non-commutative geometry, you don't have a specific point. You cannot choose like this point in this geometry. And that's the idea. Okay. All right, so let's look at this. Um, by analogy, we have this algebra, C plus C. And then we have this generalized Dirac operator. So this distance between uh, x and y will become this distance between the two points. And here you can take like all the uh, the difference between the two uh, the two complex value with the condition that this is equal uh, less than or equal to one. And then you can have, you can calculate this distance is defined as the norm of M, one uh, inverse. And here we have the distance between the two points. And so the derivative is defined as a commutator between the Dirac operator and the algebra. Yes. I think, I think the sister algebra is a norm, right? Uh -huh. Yes, right. The sister algebra has a norm it's itself, right? That's why we need to use the C-star algebra. 
at a fourth place. Because that's the, there's a norm in the C star, star algebra, and you're you're giving us as an input a, a derivative operator. Okay. So this is also the function. Yes, this uh, Dirac operator is a, a input. Right. Yes. Right. And so you're saying. And we can induce a distance in this way. Mm -hmm. So then giving the Dirac operator is sort of like specifying the metric. Right. Yes, 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 exactly. That's, 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 that's the idea. So right. Right. Yeah. This Dirac yeah. operator yeah. works as the metric. So you need an yeah. extra yeah. input on top of the other. Yes, right. yeah. exactly. Yeah. So we see that this Dirac operator encodes the distance information. OK, so what do we have? We have an algebra a representation, and a Dirac operator. So roughly speaking, the differential is the uh, function value at one point minus uh, the value at the other point. So in this case, it's lambda minus lambda prime. So it's just the, the analog of the usual differential. Okay, and uh, we also have a kind of generalization generalization of the integral. So when we take the trace, it's lambda plus lambda prime. So it's like the function value function value at one point plus the function value at the other. But in this discrete case, it's the analog of the usual uh, integral. And also I need to uh, see a little bit of this gradient stuff because we will use that later. But uh, it's not uh, itself is not very important here. So physically, we are interested in those kind of algebra with a product, uh, uh, a product of some two, uh, 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 sorry, the sum of some two algebra. Because we are interested, for example, in the standard model, we have U1 cross SU2, and we also like to build like left-right symmetric model, things like that. So. This corresponds to a representation which has also two parts. And then it's natural to equip, uh, besides this A, H, D, this is called the spectral triple. It's na natural to equip another object. So for example, in this case, we have a gamma phi, which is the chirality operator. To distinguish, actually, this is something to help us distinguish uh, from one part to the other. And in the other case, we can define this grading as one for, uh, the, for, for the upper part of the representation and the minus one for the lower part of the representation. So together with this Dirac operator, and this gradient, which helps us to distinguish one from the other, we have a two-part structure. For example, in this, in this two-point case, we have one point, another is different. Okay, now let's look at this toy model. This A, yes, so question. In the whole this non-commutative geometry uh, business, so one of the reasons why you assume non-commutative geometry is because you're kind of trying to uh, write somewhat an effective theory like a quantum graph yes. or something. Yes. Are you following that route as well? Or no? Yes, I'm going to show that. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, I will show the simplified model and uh, uh, I'll show the idea of that. Okay. okay. Right. So in this model, we have algebra C plus H. This H is the quaternion. And uh, we can choose the representation as C2 plus C2. And the uh, Dirac matrix, Dirac, uh, the Dirac operator has two parts. <coughs> uh, this M is a 2 by 2 complex matrix. So we can uh, identify the basis with the uh, particle data, with the particle spectrum, for example. We have this as the right-handed neutrino, and the right-handed electron, and so on and so forth. Since this describes the flavor space, so it does not know whether it's a lepton or it's a quark, so this basis <coughs> could define anything that 
uh, like uh, right-handed up chord, for example, and this could be a right-handed down chord. Okay, so this is just the flavor space. So for any A in this algebra, we can represent this A like this. This is a complex number, complex number from this C, and for any quaternion element, we can represent with a pair of complex number, alpha, beta, or complex number. And to give mass term of the uh, formulas, we can set this M equal to M nu, M e, or M u, M d, accordingly. So this is the way how we fit particle data into this model. And uh, let's look at the transformation. The unitary transformation needs to be the elements that are right, unitary. And uh, with this condition, we know the upper, uh, the top left block has this uh, pure phase. And this part has an extra condition, which is square, sum of the square equal to one. And from this transformation, we can simply read off the U1 charge. Because this, this U1 only acts on the right-handed sector, so I call it U1R. And the U1R charge here is like this, one minus one for right-handed sector, and zero for left-handed sector. And let's see what, how this Dirac operator transforms under this transformation. When we make this U1R cross SU2 left transformation, we see another local term popping out. In general, this matrix, this Dirac operator, does not commute with the with this matrix. Okay. So what do we do? We can we use the old trick, we come up with a gauge field. And we know how to build this gauge field based on our experience in this U1 case. So we simply write down the gauge field like this. And uh, so that we let this gauge field to extra uh, to to absorb this extra term. When we combine them two, we have a covariant theory. And let's look at this gauge field. How does it look like? This gauge this gauge field, by counting degrees of freedom, can be written as a pair of complex number. So we write this m here, and this phi. This phi is a pair of complex number. Of course, we uh, demand uh, we did this gauge field to be self adjunct uh, sorry, to be Hermitian. And then when we combine them two, we have this. Okay, so the so-called perturbation of d squared. So later I'll show you the full story of spectral action. But here, let me just uh, show you um, how to think about this. So the perturbation of the d square, so d plus a, the co covariant square minus this d square has something interesting. That is, <coughs> when we square them, we have a maximum half structure. So what do we have? This gives us a maximum half shaped potential. And uh, a phi which is expanded at a minimum not equal to zero. And also, as I have already mentioned this, so by counting degree of freedom, we have a pair of complex number. So what does this mean? This means the spontaneous symmetry breaking now has a reason. The reason is that we want to make the whole thing covariant. So we combine this derivative into this gauge field. And then we have a valve shift. <coughs> so, yes. Where did this expression, the trace of. Yeah, actually, plus this a can be a extracted square? from the spectral action. The spectral, I, I'll mention that later, but that's Samsung and S. Because the idea here uh, is, according to Kong, is that. The spectral action determines the bosonic part of the action. So I'll show you the brief idea of that later, shortly. Um, but uh, if we extract the term out of this spectral action, it's actually 
roughly like this. Okay. So there's a rule for constructing the action. Yes. And that's the kind of return that shows up. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then it has yeah, extra other terms. The really interesting thing is that when you construct the covariant derivative, the Higgs field, quote unquote, comes out automatically shifted so that the symmetry is already spontaneously broken, so to speak. Yes. But for any choice of the object, what's the condition for having spontaneously broken symmetry? Is there a condition? There are mathematical conditions, but uh, I think the uh, physical idea is like this. Is so automatically. Right, it's automatically. Yes. Generically, this model will give you. Yes, right, and that's why it's kind of interesting to put this. Is. So I we mean, can. Does that mean if I put in instead of um, it, uh, C squared representation, uh, C cubed representation, I would find uh, SU three resulting for SU three. I'll show you, okay. but that. Needs to needs another algebra. This A needs to be M three C the three by three complex matrices. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll show you just the in a few slides. And that also get, but how come you don't get a that is not broken? I don't understand why. You get I mean the, the uh, why color sector is not broken? Yeah, because we don't have a Dirac operator in that sector. Oh, or okay. the Dirac operator have a, is trivial in that sector. So you choose a Dirac operator such that yeah, this Dirac operator is, is the input. Is the input. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now we can draw this uh, chart, uh, this table. I mean, if we look at the ordinary gauge, there is a local twist due to the derivative of the parameter, right? And so do we have in this non-commutative case, and uh, we have this ordinary one form. And it is generalized to something like this. Originally, there is a base basis of the one form. Here, the basis is the matrix basis. And we can read off the component here is a hit, just like the component here. And uh, for the square, uh, I mean, for the perturbation of the stuff, it's roughly the analog of the curvature of the EML, but it's not exactly the same. But uh, I mean, formally, it's similar. When we take, uh, when we calculate the action, we take the square, and so it's here. So the analog is kind of interesting to us, although it's derived uh, I mean from the spectral action. Uh, so. Let's look at the product geometry. So when we, uh, when I say product geometry, I mean we can take the algebra. For example, in this case, the small function plus small function as the small function cross C plus C. So what does this mean? Geometrically, it's something like the base manifold cross the two point. So it's like the two sheet structure. Now, with our earlier algebra, we have something like this. So it's still like a, 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 a double layer structure. So, and uh, that's why I, I mentioned that this two part at the beginning. Okay, so for the uh, product geometry, the Dirac operator is the product like this. We, we take the... Uh, so the so does the algebra of quaternion have an interpretation in terms of points? Oh, I, think that's a I mean, I C plus C can be interpreted as two points. Yes, but this quaternion, uh, quaternion is, is a bit different. Right. As I said, uh, I, I won't go into that direction, but uh, as I said, when you go from the commutative geometry to non-commutative geometry, actually you lose the uh, locality, which means you cannot describe the geometry point by point. And... Uh, so uh, that's why I was uh, careful to uh, describe this. So you see, this part is kind of like a layer of the ordinary manifold, right? And this layer is something 
non-commutative, so it, you cannot actually resolute uh, uh, the, the point. Okay. But yeah, let's let's look at what we have at this moment. So the uh, Dirac operator is the sum of the two. The Dirac operator in this continuous direction in this phase manifold and the discrete part which is which induce this two point or this two part structure. And we can calculate the gauge field just uh, you, uh, using uh, the way we define the gauge field. So it also has two parts. One is the continuous part and the other one is the discrete part. And this uh, uh, yes, continuous part and the, the discrete part. But lo and behold, we have this ordinary gauge belt sitting diagonally and uh, a hit, quote unquote, sitting off diagonally. So here's the short summary of what we have. We have two sheet structure. We have a gauge field kind of linking in between the two sheets. And this spontaneous symmetry breaking is there automatically. So all this stuff implies a gauge field as a discrete gauge and gen uh, generally similar. So we want to accommodate this standard model, so we need to think about the color factor. For color sector, we choose a representation as C plus D3. And we identify with the basis lepton, red, green, blue. And the algebra is C plus M3C. M3C here is the 3 by 3 complex matrix. Okay, and then we represent this algebra like this. So let's look at the transformation. When we calculate the transformation, it's the, I mean, uh, we, uh, sorry, we choose the unitary uh, elements, and uh, uh, we need uh, we we need to apply this condition: determinant equal to one. Originally, C plus H. If we choose the unitary elements, it automatically has this determinant equal to one. Right? But uh, for here we need to apply this determinant equal to one. So we have this upper left power, up left power, uh, this E minus I theta, and this part, down right power, three by three bar. And from this, actually, we can read off the U1 chart in this case. So in this case, the U1 charge is for the lepton is minus one. For the quarks, it's one third, and we recognize this immediately as the B minus L charge. And this kind of gives us the symmetry of U1 B minus L cross SU3. So let's combine them two. If we want to combine them to the algebra is C plus H and M3C. And we use the tensor representation, which is the tensor of the flavor sector times the color sector. And uh, uh, the representation space is denoted as 2 right plus 2 left cross 1 plus 3. It's the flavor space and the Right, the color space. We identify them with the standard model's particle spectrum. For example, we have this left handed neutrino as this, right? So the left handed spin, uh, iso spin up times lepton is within this space. And we have the green right handed down quark as this. So for, for, for ordinary quark, we <coughs> is within this subspace. Okay, so we kind of identify them with the particle data. And then we 
have this charge conjugate. This charge conjugate works as the flip of the flavor sector and the color sector. The reason I call it charge conjugate is because of some kind of commutation relation. When you flip, you make the charge minus. Or you can think, of, think about it this way. Later on, we will use this representation as the firm, fermion representation. And we write anti-fermion this way. So it takes fermion to anti-fermion. So it's something like the flip of the charge. But uh, it's really com uh, it really comes from the commutation relation. So um, right, you can see that this J, A, J inverse sandwich term is nothing but the A applied on the right sector. Okay. But uh, physically, what do we have? We, have? we had the U1 right charge. We had U1 B minus L. So right in this representation is this and this. If we combine them two, we have this standard model hyper, U1 hypercharge. It's just the, the sum of these two because we have combined the flavor sector and the color sector. So, okay, let me talk a little bit about this spectral action. Before we yes. go on. So, it, it looks to me that you can encode your gauge group uh -huh. in, your, in your C star algebra. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I'm not sure about the exceptional ones, but I it looked to me like you could certainly put any classical gauge group in. Uh -huh. And the, I guess what you want to think of as your fermion spectrum would come in the represent in your, what you call H, right? Mm -hmm. What, you can choose your representation from the these gauge groups by choosing those appropriately. Uh, the representation is kind of chosen because this kind of, the choice of representation determines um, like uh, the charges or the uh, basis which can be identified with the particle. So this representation is kind of chosen by hand, but there are certain uh, arguments mathematically why we should have this two-dimensional plus two-dimensional representation chosen. <coughs> but uh, physically at this moment, I do not have a good so for that, I mean, we don't have a restriction for that choice at this moment. Uh, I think Felix's question was not finished. Oh. No, well, I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is to the point. I mean, yeah. couldn't I could have made other choices for the representation structure? I could have put in sure plus some other thing. Some instead of a C, you know, I, you had the algebra of three by three matrices, but I can choose it to to, to act on, um, mm -hmm. you know. C8 or something like that, mm -hmm. and I could get what I would later think of as the adjoint representation of SC3 you know, when you did your construction, I believe, if I understood mm -hmm. what you were doing correctly. And I think I can get any representation in this way, or construct any sum of representations in this way. And then your choice of your D mm -hmm. seems to be, you're telling us, depending on how you choose it, that's like putting in a a scalar Higgs, mm -hmm. but what representation seems to have something to do with the this fermion contact representation that you chose in H? It, it, you know, it can only be in a representation that interpolates between the rep representations. Well, I think the idea is thing. that uh, you need to choose the representation first. And after you choose the representation, uh, you apply this determinant equal to one condition, you automatically have this charge assi assigned automatically. So the idea is that, sure, you can argue like we have other degrees of freedom to choose the representation, we can choose any representation we want. But the funny thing, I think the interesting thing is that if we choose this representation, this hypercharge or the U1 right charge, things like that, implies some kind of determinant equal to one. So that implies something like we should take the gauge altogether like one whole part, something like that. Well, I guess maybe you're, you ask, you're asking how unique this is, right? I'm, I'm asking what no, class of um, 
gauge theory LeBron terms, just in terms of gauge groups and uh, fermion and boson content, can you in encode? That's, that's a in very good question. And we're still studying that because in the literature there are conflicting mm -hmm. opinions about it. Yeah, that's uh, true. But there are people who work on this who claim that you know there's a restriction on the kind of gauge groups and representations you can have, and then there are other people who claim that that's all false. Uh, uh, you can sort of have other, you know, any gauge theory you like in this form, and we're still trying to sort out the details. But the interesting thing is. You know, we didn't choose the hypercharges, we just chose the algebra. No, I see. And the representation and the hypercharges automatically come out. Come out. So there's a nice coincidence. Yeah, there's some yeah. kind there's some kind of hidden reason reason why hypercharges have to be but it might have something to do with anomalies. That's another very good yes. question. <laughs> <laughs> and we're yeah, trying to sort that out. Do this for anomaly free. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's that's yeah. a good question. In, 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 in a lot of cases, it's anomaly free, but uh, it's not guaranteed in every case. So there are examples where you don't have anomaly free. Like yes, yeah. uh, there are some uh, certain examples. Uh, we are currently working on that. There are lots of claims in the literature, but they are very undecipherable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, in addition to the field and content and the gauge group and so forth, you're now going to tell us that there's also some more or less natural choice of action uh -huh. that comes out of that. That's yes. Out of the, uh, yes. Besides the representation stuff, let's think about this action, um, the choice of action, actually. So the claim, according to uh, James D and company, um, we can build uh, the action based on the spectral action principle. So by that, it means that the physical, actually bosonic action, bosonic part of the action only depends upon the spectrum of the Dirac operator. So what does that mean? That means we can take this Dirac operator, um, and this uh, f is nothing, but uh, it works as the cutoff function. So it's like like a step step function. For anything larger than one, it goes to zero sufficiently fast. And this lambda, capital lambda, is something to absorb the dimension because the arc operator is the dimension one, mass dimension one. So yes. what what do you mean by physical bosonic action? Do you can get you have to Actually, throw away also something that is non bosonic? Because this this part here only encodes the bosonic part, like a uh, uh, gauge field, right? And you have, well, you see this, I use this D sub A, which is D plus A, and A encodes like the continuous gauge, the W boson, B, uh, Z boson, right? And the uh, takes, so it's the bosonic part encoded in this action. It's not added, fermion is not added yet. Oh, so there is no interaction with fermion? I will add that later. Oh, okay. So this is only gives that. Right. Okay. Right. So inside this, we have all those gauge fields, and those are the bosonic part. So the idea is that, okay, we, we also need to take the trace, which works sort of like the integral. Okay. So the idea is that we can expand this term, and after we expand it, we will have the Lagrangian, the, the Lagrangian density for the bosonic part. So what do we have? After we extend it, so I, I actually copied this part from the uh, Kong's book. So we have several terms. For the Higgs term, I have showed you that some structure of the Higgs, right? So it could be extracted from the bosonic action. And uh, the more interesting part is the yang Mills. We have the yang Mills part coming out as a whole, uh, trace of uh, uh, the trace of some whole curvature and uh, in our language it's the sum of the three parts so this is a u1 gauge that people done and this is the glow and uh, all these a b c d e they are just uh, uh, some parameters so a is uh, uh, sorry I, I, I copied this so 
I didn't change the notation here. So this is just the, the M in my notation in the in the Dirac operator. So this is of A is of the mass order square, and B is of the uh, order of mass to the fourth. Things like that. Okay. So the, the gauge couplings are, are they are there. They're Same also thing. with values determined by this. Uh, yes. Yes. Because they are sitting in front of this part, and they are something calculated from one whole piece of the curvature. So in order to have this correct uh, uh, normalization for the kinetic term, we have this. Because they, just, uh, they are derived from one curvature. Mm -hmm. right? And this, we can recognize that this is a gut coupling relation. And also, I have showed you that uh, we have right, the uh, Higgs potential. And also, uh, the interesting thing is that we have a mass relation. So this mass is W boson mass. W boson square is equal to sum of the fermionic masses divided by A. And this I is the generation, the sum of all the generations. On which scale this is true? Like at any at this moment? At any scale, I mean, no, like there's, there's there is no scale, but if you want to interpret the scale based on this relation, you it's something like the at the gas scale. But the theory it does not have a natural scale at this moment. And this is something I will mention later. And it's something interesting. Okay. Now why do we have this relation? So if you look at this, you see that uh, uh, the uh, Higgs self-coupling is something related to the fermionic mass square here. And also, uh, we can calculate the Higgs uh, mass. right? And after we have this Higgs mass, since they are all coupled with this factor and uh, the are kind of related to the gauge boson that way. But I have a more intuitive way to think about this. Okay, so as I said, we have taken this Dirac operator as a derivative or sort of differential on the discrete direction. So for the fermionic action, we have this sandwich term, right? So if we really want to take this discrete derivative, so to speak, seriously, we should have a counter term, uh, I mean, sorry, the counterpart, the corresponding part for the boson. So for D, uh, for, for boson, we have D squared here. And D squared is nothing but the sum of the fermionic masses. So this is the intuitive way to think about this. But actually, everything you can calculate from the spectral action. And after some song and dance, you need to use the heat kernel expansion, so on and so forth. But I think this is the message, physical message, we get at this moment. And that relation is roughly correct, actually, right? Oh, uh, yes. If you plug <laughs> <a> number, <laughs> <if you plug laughs> the amazing thing is it's, it's roughly correct. So it's kind of like implying something interesting behind it. Okay. How close to correct is it? Is that scale values? I forgot. Uh, well, you know, you can just put in the top clock mass on the right hand uh, side. Or yes. Mm. Real A and uh, yeah, one I think five squared and maybe D squared. What is it? Yeah. Mostly right. Like well, right order of magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, besides. Mm. Question? No. Okay. Besides this, we also uh, in this. So I, I remember that, that there was like a claim that there's a constraint on the Higgs mass. Oh uh, yes, there is one, and it's wrong. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, this is the Higgs mass calculated uh, by Cohn and the company uh, with this simplest uh, uh, assumption to fit all the particle data, and. Uh, since this is only one choice of the uh, algebra and uh, uh, one choice of this representation, so on and so forth. So 
so the, uh, I think currently there are several ways they are still working on. How do you get that? Do you remember? How do we get the yeah. fixed mass? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Because it do doesn't enter in that format, no? Uh, it is there. So you see, we have huh? after. Oh, this is. See, we have a here. A is the sum of the fermion mass. Oh, I see. Right. So and the, mm -hmm. the self coupling is also determined by the sum of the force. Okay. Okay. So you can can be careful. You calculate the corrections to the Higgs mass due to Yukawa coupling, like top cross loops and stuff? No, we, so we do all that, and 170 is the so result. Yeah, 170 is after. It comes after. Yeah, all, all yeah. it's after all the RG running. Mm -hmm. running. Yes. Okay. Uh, so currently, there are uh, people working on how to correct this. So I think. Uh, uh, let me mention this bri uh, briefly. So one of the uh, way is that we want uh, uh, we want another scalar to compete with the Higgs so that we can lower the Higgs mass in the theory. And that scalar can be either generated by promoting a term that is responsible for the Majorana mass term uh, for the Majorana mass of the right hand neutrino to fill or it can be generated in a larger algebra. I think those are the currently two uh, popular ways to work around and to introduce the extra scalar to lower the Higgs mass. Um, there might be some other way, but uh, I think currently, like uh, Devastado and the company, they are working on these two ways. So there are some fun facts of the theory. Um, let's look at this uh, commutator term, because almost uh, everything is caused by this term, actually. Mm. So when we uh, do some perturbation of the field, or uh, sorry, I mean transformation, we, uh, we take phi to phi plus del phi. So this del phi is, can be expanded this, this way. Epsilon i is just a parameter, a number, okay? And the sigma i is the generator, or the algebraic ge generator applied on this phi. And uh, we can combine them to uh, something like this. So, when we calculate the action, mm -hmm. so this is uh, elementary, we have uh, something like this, okay, and J is the north of current. Epsilon is the, uh, the, the parameter. So we see there is a symmetry when this north of current is conserved. And uh, actually, we, uh, what we mean is that this term equal to zero. So when this term equal to zero, we have a global symmetry. And when this term is not equal to zero, we have a local symmetry, but we need a gauge field to absorb this derivative term. Okay. So by analogy, here we have the sandwich term, and uh, we have the local twisting term. And uh, this term is the analog of this term here, the derivative of epsilon j. And we say it's kind of like the analog of the um, ordinary uh, case. So this, when this equals zero, it's kind of like a global symmetry of this discrete direction. And when this is not equal to zero, we need a gauge field, a local, quote unquote, local gauge uh, a, lo a local symmetry that can be fulfilled. And, and what do we mean by global and local in this discrete direction? So when, when this term is equal to zero, so when this term equal to zero, we say there is a so-called global symmetry in the discrete direction. And uh, this refers to the du commutator equals zero. Uh, U is the 
symmetry transformation. Uh, what does this mean? This means du equal to ud, which is d equal to ud u dagger. So this, and if we want to take this d as like a mass term or the valve shift, this means there is a symmetry remaining, a remaining symmetry, which makes the valve invariant. And uh, with this, actually, we can study. Um, yeah, we are currently studying this. But with this, we can sort of cook up a model that breaks the symmetry with a chain. Like every time we uh, introduce like a, a discrete gauge, we can study the remaining symmetry by looking at the use that fulfill this this, this relation, which makes the valve invariant. And so by that, we can, the hope is that we can build, for example, a breaking chain. And uh, in, the, uh, in, the ca in the simple case, when a is equal to h plus h, for example, we have this d, like this, like before. And uh, pictorially, it's like we have these two sheets. And when we do a transformation, there's sort of like a twist between the left sheet and the right sheet. And this local derivative sort of describes the, the twisting between the two sheets. But the funny thing is, even when we make the left hand, left sheet and right sheet rotate similarly with the same SU2 rotation, there will be a still twisting term, this D a d commuting with u is still zero unless we have up quark equal to down quark mass, which is an isospin like this. So this is just a, an example for fun. It's like a, this two sheet structure. The d u commutator to, uh, is kind of like the described twist. But if we do this, there is still a twist unless the u equal to d. And uh, another uh, fun fact is that since we have this two sheet structure, so there's a separation encoded by this Dirac operator. And we see that this part, the discrete part, is kind of blind, independent to the base manifold. So what do we have? We have an extra, kind of like extra dimension, but discrete. <coughs> And the separation in this direction is kind of like uh, the electroweak scale, because I mean, according to the uh, particle data, we we have these fermionic masses encoded in this separation. And uh, if we really want to interpret the gauge coupling relation, it's kind of like the gut scale. And remember that uh, gauge coupling relation comes out of the perturbation on this continuous direction. So it's like there is a characteristic scale, like at the gas scale, on this continuous base manifold, and another scale in this discrete direction. And uh, in general, they are not the same, right? And uh, what's their relation? We are, we are still thinking, uh, thinking about it. But uh, in general, they are like two scales. So when the separation goes to infinity, what happens is that since this Dirac operator's spectrum inverse encodes this separation, so the mass goes to zero, which is which corresponds to separation goes to infinity. So what do we ha uh, what, how do we interpret this? So geometrically, they are infinitely far away from each other, so they cannot reach each other, and physically, the left sheet stop talking to the right sheet, because it's massless. Of course, it's fixed on the chirality uh, state. And uh, we also so have- Just ask a question about the yes. separation. It's very, very reminiscent of um, brain world periods, I think, where you have the gauge group, say, uh -huh. on the n-coincident brains, and you separate them, and the separation scale, uh, 
egg uh -huh. is proportional to the Higgs VEV, and so you have discrete parallel worlds. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering if there is a mapping of that of that yeah. organization under this construction. So that's a, that's a good question. We also ask that actually uh, ourselves, because <coughs> at this moment. Um, we don't know the clear correspondence between that. Uh, and also because this separation is discrete, so actually it's nothing in between, except. Uh, well, in this sense, yes. effectively nothing in between. Yes, effectively, yes. <laughs> but, uh, right. Um, I think the, the, the short answer is that uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I think that's an interesting point to think, uh, to, to think about. As far as you've been able to see, there's no point at which that analogy breaks down. Oh, uh, yes. Um, right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, we're still working on it. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's interesting to think about whether it carries like the different charge uh, carries charges like that in the brain, right? Uh, as brain. Uh, I don't know. We are still working. So there, are, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, uh, mysterious stuff, but uh, some of them are kind of interesting in the sense that they kind of imply something <coughs> behind the scenes. So there is a hint for this lab for asymmetry. As I have shown you, that uh, if we don't take into account the u1 sub r, there's a u1 b minus l, right, and it's kind of easy to generate to the left right symmetric model. We just make the simplest modification, which is change the c to h. We have h for left, h for right, and then automatically we have this u1 b minus l charge. So there. Uh, there are hints for the left right symmetry behind the scene, and uh, uh, currently we are working on a phenomenology paper uh, <coughs> in preparation. Uh, and so far, you can see that this is the classical theory. We have the other four operators everywhere, and uh, we don't know how to incorporate the quantum effect yet. But the funny thing is that even this is a classical theory, it gives us a gut relation. So that's something kind of funny. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not introducing new degrees of freedom or new gauge group to make the coupling meet, right? It's just the coming out of the box. Without, without the gut group. Right, right. Without, without gut, gut group. Without any gut groups. Yes. What do you mean you don't know how to include that? So you have a Lagrangian, what, what uh -huh. do you mean that you don't tell me classically? You see, the thing is that we have this theory, and uh, from there, okay, at least this, con this is Kant's idea. We have this theory, and then from there, we quantize, use the ordinary quantum field, uh, quantum field theory point of view uh, approach. And, but uh, we don't know how to incorporate this quantization in this geometrical point of view. Like what happens to the geometry if we quantize? Like that. I think at this moment it's not very clear yet. Well, we get a Lagrangian, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and once we get a Lagrangian, we can say, oh, it's just regular field theory or something and quantize it in the usual yeah. way, and that's what we're doing right now. Yes. But in principle, you know, the whole thing is supposed to come out from this non commutative geometry or something. Mm -hmm. So the path integral you do should take into account the fact that you're sort of not doing a path integral. company have attempted to construct path integrals, but yeah. it's hard. Yeah, I think they pointed out it's hard to define the measure and stuff. But uh, so it hasn't been <coughs> completed yet. So right now what people who work in the field do is they just take the branch and ask the classical branch and they quantize from there. But mm -hmm. that's not supposed to be the complete picture. Yeah. At the moment At we, we don't think it's the complete we do what we can. At this moment, it's like the emergent structure at, at one scale, at least. 
is is not running with uh, right with so CR. So you forth. think it might not be the complete picture because you're thinking that the, our usual quantization rules that we apply to Lagrangians will actually be modified inside of the yeah, 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 there might be. Yeah, there might be. There might be some modification. And, uh, and, and and also, you know, the gut relation comes out, but you know, there's there's nothing that tells you where the scale has to be or something. So and that you basically sort of adjust by hand if it fit the phenomenology or something like that. And, and other things, and there are lots of unsatisfactory factors in here which we like to clean up. Okay. So. Okay, so I, I was saying that this is very easy. Uh, it's very easy to uh, go extend to the uh, Laplace symmetric case, and in this case, we also have a gut relation because the calculation is similar. And for this coupling relation, if we use the ordinary mixing and breaking, we see it's actually the same relation, or in other words, it's the relation at the same scale. So it's like the Laplace symmetry and the standard model uh, coupling relation, gut relation, are at the same scale. What does that mean? So it, it could be like this Laplace symmetry breaks down at the gut scale, or maybe some other uh, interpretation. But uh, this observation is kind of interesting to us. And also, there are questions we have already mentioned. I have to accommodate, uh, accommodate Wilsonian picture, the Wilsonian uh, view, and the quantization report. Do I have more? Ah, yes, the summary. Okay. So now, what do we have is kind of like a recipe of this generalized gauge theory with this. We have the spectral tree form as the input, and uh, uh, take this mass matrix as derivative, trace as kind of like the integral, and the generalized gauge field. Then we calculate the spectral action. And uh, what do we have? So the output is that we have a two sheet structure and an extra but discrete dimension. At this moment, we should call it direction because it's not yet that clear, but uh, we definitely have this structure, the separation structure. And uh, we can discuss the separation in different cases, like massless case, or take, a, take it as a second scale. And uh, Higgs is a, really uh, a, a gauge in that direction. And also now spontaneous <coughs> symmetry breaking is out of the box. If based on standard model fermions and bosons, well, except the Higgs at this moment. But uh, as I mentioned, there are ways to accommodate that, because uh, I just uh, showed the simplest example that can fit most of the standard model particle data. And there is a gut without new degrees of freedom. And we have mass relation between the W boson and fermions. And it has the capability to predict Higgs mass because they are all related. The coupling, couplings uh, right, uh, are all related. And we have this local tree. Oh, we can study like different settings of mass with the local trace. And uh, we can look at the other current and maybe more. I think that's pretty much of it. And, uh, here are the references by Kahn, Chemsetin. And also in this paper, we have studied a specific non commutative geometry, uh, which uses the super connection as the framework. So it's a specific type of the realization of the non commutative geometry. And uh, that's it. Thank you. So you have a for an action which you call the spectral action, but huh. it's not unique in the sense that you could you could change that description if you wanted to. There were terms like uh, 
that that trace, which is more or less the field strength, instead of squared, you could also add in terms of the force if you wanted to. Well, uh, analogs like that, or that thing. I think the, by the I think the spectral action um, is kind of uh, constraining that part. Uh, I I want to show the physics, so I pull out just one part of that, mm -hmm. which is like trace square. But uh, if you really look at it, the the heat kernel expansion, uh, I think it has pretty much fixed. Okay. I mean, the universal term at least. Yeah, but what could, what could it mean? So you might want to add like d to the fourth or the lambda to the fourth or something like that before you take the trace. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this f is pretty arbitrary. This f is any function that dumps sufficiently yeah. quick. So it already already includes those kind of terms. I just write that as the variable. So this function could be chosen anything you want. <coughs> and, uh, I think the the uh, let me think of I think the idea is that after you expand it, this f, <coughs> no matter what f you choose, for example, you choose d over lambda to the six or something like that. Uh, we have the, the f dependence is minimal. The f dependence only appears here, like f0 and fn is the uh, minus one momentum integral f. So the f dependence only appears roughly here, and there's the f2 over there. So I think that's, that dependence is fairly small. You have this degree of freedom, yes. But, but there are also the analog of higher trace terms as well, right? In other words... Oh, you mean the trace square, square maybe? Square or... Uh, uh, and so forth. Like maybe we put right. a, a square here. Or something. Yeah. Uh, I don't... I'm not sure. Because if you really want to take the trace like integral, how do you write the action? The integral of Lagrangian density, right? You don't write the integral of Lagrangian density than square or something like that. So... I'm not sure what happens if we choose the tree square. I see. So you're saying that would not no longer be um, what we would call a local action. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any question? So, uh, so we can always resort back to things which depend on coordinates and expand. But suppose in the end we're, su we're supposed to throw away the crash of this relation to coordinates. So in this completely algebraic formulation, mm -hmm. what should be the observables? Usually we measure either amplitudes, scattering amplitudes, or correlation mm -hmm. functions, and neither of those will be that well defined in this algebraic formula. Yeah, that um, fundamentally is a, a very interesting question, because at this moment, what is non-commutative is just uh, the discrete part, right? And uh, we keep the locality in the base manifold. And uh, if you really want to change the locality, you should like uh, discretize or uh, non-commutative, non-commutatize everything, mm. right? And the what would be the observable is like, there are different ideas. Uh, for example, y you could argue that you lose locality, so the probe would be something different like the point like stuff like the particle it's not particle signal you could have some other signal I don't know yet uh, well I think there are some applications like uh, for, for example in the quantum Hall effect right you have this non commutative setting and uh, you have some certain different observables but definitely it's different from the particle, the point like observable. It's not a, a peak, a resonance peak. Other questions? Okay.